I move now to the opposition and to Johan Christensen. Johan is an assistant professor at the University of Leiden. His research focuses on the role of experts and expertise in public policymaking. His newest book, Expertise, Policymaking and Democracy, will be published in autumn 2020. Johan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, members of the, uh, of the House, um, for the chance to, to wrap up, I think, uh, or almost. Um, so I want you to imagine something, um, not a completely far-fetched scenario. Uh, imagine that you are a prime minister who has just come to power at the head of the government. Your government is immediately faced with a range of issues that you need to address. There are the urgent ones, such as an economic crisis, a war in a not-so-far-away country, rising prices on gas and electricity. There are also long, long-standing problems that require your attention, um, such as uh, the emissions of climate gases or uh, the state of the education system. How do you go about dealing with these issues? You quickly realize that the overarching priorities and policy positions that you outlined in your election manifesto, if you had one, that is, will only get you so far. For each of the issues faced by your government, more information is needed. Information on the causes of the problem, on the possible courses of action, on the likely effects on the different courses of action. Um, how will it affect the international energy market if you impose a price cap on gas and electricity? What interventions will be most effective in cutting climate gas emissions? The ministers in your cabinet are all seasoned politicians with a good grasp of a range of policy issues acquired through a long political career. Most of them also have higher education, I'm sure, from places like this. Yet, the combined knowledge of your cabinet is not close to sufficient to answer any of these questions. Yes. bias in their thought process and confirmation bias. There are certain studies in social psychology that suggest that the higher your IQ and the more you know about a certain field, the more likely you are to invest those IQ points in finding more arguments for your own side, but you're absolutely no better in finding arguments for the opposing side. So it leads you into blind alleys and confirmation bias. And I think experts in some cases can be really susceptible to this. Thank you for the point, but I haven't actually said that. <laughs> I've only been talking about the political side so far. Um, so, so, so I'll move on. Um, so, so I was saying, you know, the, the combined knowledge of your cabinet is not close to sufficient to answer any of these questions. On each of these issues, you depend fundamentally on the input of experts with specialized knowledge about uh, how the human body and mind works or about how the global environment works. And um, this, members of the House, is what we can call the fact of expertise. It is a fact of politics and government today that political leaders depend on experts who can provide specialized knowledge on everything from vaccines to climate change. Societies today are so complex and specialized that government and citizens will not be able to make sound and well-founded political choices without consulting experts. And no, members of the proposition here. Airline pilots, car mechanics, and plumbers are not enough. We need more experts than that. Therefore, pretending that we can somehow do without the experts is a dangerous fiction. That we can somehow replace expert knowledge with lived experience or citizen deliberations or gut feeling, as some people seem to propose, is unrealistic and will only lead to worse policies. Contemporary societies simply cannot do without experts. And this is my main point. Then, of course, there are tensions between expertise and democracy, the fact that expert knowledge is unequally distributed by definition, it is specialized, it is exclusive, raises problems for democratic systems that are based on the principle of political equality. But this is an inevitable tension in any modern democracy. Of course, experts have biases, and they do make mistakes. But the answer to these problems is not to get rid of the experts. 
Instead, we need to deal with the problems that experts raise for democratic societies. Uh, and, and more specifically, I try to be as specific as possible, we need to think about how we can organize the participation of experts in policymaking in ways that, on the one hand, limit the expert biases and mistakes that we've been talking about, uh, and, and maximize the benefits of listening to experts for the quality of policies. On the other hand, we need to organize expert participation in a way that, that minimizes the, the costs for democracy and equal participation. Uh, and I'd like to mention two ways this can be done. Uh, and, and these points have, have um, been brought up, uh, I think, already in the discussion, and, and that is expert diversity uh, and expert accountability. So one way to avoid expert biases and, and uh, minimize democratic costs is to ensure diversity of experts. First of all, uh, as has been discussed during the COVID pandemic, we saw the dangers of relying on single expert disciplines. Point of information. Yeah. Um, the, I wrote a book about where the virus came from. For most of the time when I was doing that, Facebook censored anyone who speculated that it might have been a lab leak. Is that diversity of opinion or is that unacceptable in your view? Thank you for the point. Um, well, I haven't made the point yet, but I'm, I'm going to make a point about disciplinary diversity. So, so, so not necessarily diversity of opinion in that sense. But let me make my point and then maybe you can, uh, you can come back. Um, so, so the problem was in many countries, for instance in the Netherlands where I work, uh, the exclusive reliance on medical advisors led to biases and blind spots in the advice of, of government. Uh, so uh, the advice focused exclusively on the situation in the hospitals, uh, but did not or, or, or ignored what was going on in schools, in the cultural sector, in the economy. Um, uh, and an answer to this problem is to call on the advice of experts from a range of different disciplines. That way, medical perspectives are confronted with the perspectives of child psychologists or economists. And by including a broader range of disciplinary perspectives, um, we increase uh, the chance of making uh, better decisions and uh, shedding light on more relevant aspects of the problem. But it may be equally crucial to ensure that experts are diverse along other dimensions, as, as one of the um, uh, interveners here earlier noted. Uh, that might be in terms of gender, it might be in terms of race, it might be in terms of social background, perhaps even in terms of political views. Uh, one example from the Biden administration was his commission to look into Supreme Court reform. Uh, he, um, he, he chose to compose that commission of legal experts from as wide an ideological spectrum as possible. Uh, and the report they produced was, was quite authoritative. They didn't reach a consensus, of course, um, but, but uh, shed light on various aspects of the problem. Moving to my final point, a second way to mitigate the problems of um, expertise in democracy um, is to ensure expert accountability. So we've been dancing around this, this notion of accountability um, all, all night, so let me try to, to say what, what we can mean by expert accountability. So expert accountability requires that um, experts explain their assumptions, their evidence, the uncertainty of their estimates, goes back to the question of humility, what they know and what they do not know about um, uh, an issue. This involves transparency, it involves deliberation, uh, and it involves submitting expert judgment to review by other actors. So who exactly should experts be accountable to? There are several possible layers of accountability. Uh, most obviously, uh, you as a scientist should be accountable to your own discipline. Uh, but this principle is, of course, institutionalized in all academic disciplines. We have peer review uh, and mechanisms like that for ensuring, um, for ensuring accountability. I also just discussed accountability to, to other disciplines. But we can also think about experts explaining their arguments in um, even broader form. So for instance, to uh, people who have practical experience uh, or practical expertise on an issue, such as bureaucrats running programs, um, people from interest groups who have relevant knowledge about how a policy works on the ground, but also to citizens within the broader public sphere. Yes, please. I think you've just raised an excellent point for about teams needing to be multidisciplinary. But I think there's another problem that comes into play with expert panels, which is about diversity of thinking. Because if you look at the sorts of advisory panels here in the UK, which would be my field of 
expertise mm -hmm. and interview them, you might find some multidisciplinary aspects, possibly still not enough, but what you find is they become quite homogenous in their style of thinking. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I interviewed a few people who were basically ejected from panels for being wild cards. That was a term that was actually used. So the outliers get pushed out. So you end up with group thinking. Do you have a practical suggestion for how to deal with those sorts of psychological <coughs> dynamics and expert panels? Thank you for the point. That's an excellent point. Um, I think we need to distinguish two issues in a sense here. That, um, of course, a frequently raised um, criticism of, of academia is that it's, it's left-leaning, right? So, so if you ask academics to, to give advice on something, you'll not only get their expert advice, but you'll also get you know, uh, their, their ideological uh, leanings. Um, I think that's a valid point, and it might be a problem in, uh, in some context, uh, but I think we also need to think about whether, of course, we all have political views. We all have ideological backgrounds, but we also need to think about whether those ideological and political views are actually driving the content of our advice and whether that is the most important thing in deciding what we decide to advise um, or not. And in some fields, uh, that might be the case. In other fields, um, it might not. But do you have a practical suggestion for how to deal with the group psychology in those panels? Because I haven't come across an expert panel yet where that sort of group think doesn't happen. Well, I guess the things we've been, been talking about so far, so for instance, um, multidisciplinarity, people would tend to think differently. I mean, yeah. as, as opposed to having only economists on the panel, uh, if you have economists, sociologists, political scientists, there, there's bound to be some diversity uh, within uh, that group. Uh, yes, please. You could also easily introduce someone who has the role of the devil's advocate who has to go against the, the common sense, and hmm. that could be an argument that either side could use, but it's just like a practical suggestion that Mm. Yes, that's an, that's an excellent point. I, I, I embrace this very much. And it says, please conclude. So I will conclude. Um, just repeat my basic point then. We need the experts. So I would ask the House to oppose uh, the motion. Thank you very much.